We're going over electric heat systems and finishing up with heat pumps. So let's just kind of start off on a basics level. Electricity, what do we have? We have electrons flowing through, right? We were creating a path of, of uh, elect electrical flow by having a positive or a higher concentration of electrons flowing to a lesser concentration of electrons, right? Inevitably, the heat we were typically generating, and this is, is resistive based heat, right? So if, when it comes on, you're gonna have a constant reading. It shouldn't be fluctuating unless it's like an SCR style, which we'll get into SCRs a little bit later. But we have two primary types that we deal with, single phase, three phase. Uh, we'll get into what's special about three phase. But um, did everybody understand electron flow? Because honestly, it's pretty critical when it comes to electric heat systems. So? Think so? Yeah, the electrons are just this this atom can't hold as many, so it releases it to here. And then that whole process wants to go to the one that's got the least. Basically. Everything you don't a big thing to always keep in mind is nature always wants to achieve equilibrium. Always. And if there's ever more of something somewhere, it wants to move somewhere where there's less of so, less of that thing. Um, now where that gets a little tricky is when you start talking about having phases, right? So you can have a regular single phase 120 or 277 heat strip. And in that particular case, you'll have, uh, uh, you'll have L1 and neutral coming into your, your uh, terminal block. And then that will feed over to a heater going through a contactor. Right? In this particular case, you've got literally just one phase coming through there and it's completing the circuit and this neutral is just feeding back to ground. Right? Now, where things get a little interesting, and we're going to just kind of have fun with some science here, it's really not all that field applicable, but you have an L2, you have, um, these are actually not phased exactly the same, right? They do, or they are slightly phased off of each other, and they have to be to work. And so, um, but technically, you know, you could have uh, 277 here, and you'd have 277 here, together they make 480. You have a 480 heat, heat strip over here. Uh, you know, and, and it's, you, your 277s are basically converging. Right? So there's, there's a couple of ways that this can, this can work. A lot of the time, we may only end up actually breaking just one leg. Most of the time. You'll end up break just one leg of it, now in this circuit, you'll have uh, some additional things. So we'll also have a, um, uh, a high limit. And many times, like in a, uh, blah, 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 blah. in a, uh, like a fan power box or something, you're gonna have a fan proving switch, which is a pressure based switch, uh, actually. It would come like this. So if you don't know, this is the representation of pressure, right? So a high pressure switch, low pressure switch would have a, sim a similar symbol or the same symbol. And it's just in this case, instead of reading, you know, refrigerant pressure, we're reading air pressure with a, um, with a fan proving, all right? So these are two very common safeties, high limit. You know, most of the high limits we deal with today are going to be um, a bimetal disc type high limit. Okay, it'll have a little black box. Some of them you can even adjust. Uh, many times it'll just be kind of a circle with kind of a stub out and it'll have a spade connector here. Have another stub out spade connector. It'll have a sticker here in the middle with some writing on it and that will be your high limit 
many, many times that high limit will have a number on it like L180 um, uh, and then it may have something like a C, uh, we'll say 50, okay? may not be 100%, I may have it backwards, but usually these numbers will indicate to you this will be like a trip point, okay? So it's, this is going to open at 180 degrees at the strip. And then it's going to close with a differential of 50 degrees. So 130 degrees. Mm -hmm. okay. So it would be something along those lines. This may be the close point, this may be the differential to open. So you just you kind of have to look at the numbers and pay attention. I don't exactly remember off memory how those terminations specify, but it'll make it apply common sense to it. You know, whenever you see it at that time, right? It'll make sense. Um, there are some. Um, I do want to touch on. So this is the most common type of safety we deal with today. But there are some other styles, such as what's, what's known as a, a fusible link, all right? So a fusible link is, it would have a, like a ceramic disc, and I'm going to draw this, so this is a top down, I'm going to draw a side view. You're going to have a ceramic disc with two spades, and it's going to come down here. We used to, the old school text called these teardrop limits, because it literally looked like a little, um, a little teardrop, here's your little fuse coming back. And this would sit in the same place as the, uh, the bimetal limit. The difference is, uh, this is, so these bimetals will reset, these fusible links will not. I actually still have a whole thing of uh, uh, fusible links in my electrical kit that I carry with me. I haven't touched them in probably five years. But they're still there. You know, this was a very common thing to run into at one time. We don't use them anymore on majority of equipment. But you, you could, con well, actually, no, you couldn't convert these because they had a very specific uh, ceramic shape. They were kind of they, they looked like a teardrop. They kind of had a a weird oval shape to them. Or these will be round. Now, do y'all understand what the term bimetal is? Right. So it's literally, it's, it's two metals that are mated together and one metal contracts at a different rate than the other metal. And so once it heats up to a certain point, it will go from convex one way to concave the other. And so that's those two, two metals flexing at different temperatures because they don't expand and contract at the same points. That's how the mechanical action works on them. Uh, can everybody hear me online? Okay, making sure I'm coming through clear. Somebody give me a yes or no. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so, like I said, if you run into these, these do still exist. I don't know how much you will see them, but if you ever do, at least you know what it is. The fusible link. Uh, the really, really old school ones was before they even started putting them in the ceramic, uh, they would literally, uh, they would wire in line. And these, these are in line, by the way. Uh, these, these are a load duty uh, limit. They could be pilot duty, but most of the time they weren't. Uh, but the really old school ones, they would be right here. And so right as you're coming through your um, your plates inside of your panel. So this is this is your your uh, uh, electrical cover plate, right? Uh, it would be right here on the other side, and it'd have a nut here and a nut here, and the little string would go there in the middle. And that's where those used to be mounted. As time progressed, we eventually upgraded to putting them in ceramic, and this made them a lot more reliable and easier to change. To change them up with these, you could literally do it without having to pull the whole heat kit. When they were this style, you had to remove that entire heat kit every time. So, and it's just something to be aware of is, it may be possible if you're working on a really old unit, 
it may have an inline fusible link in it trip because say the blower motor the capacitor went started to go bad the motor starts to slow down too much heaters get too hot because they don't have enough airflow it burns that, that fusible link apart internally it won't do it externally it'll be internal and so you'll lose continuity through it uh, you may not have anything wrong with that heat strip it may just simply be that that, that uh, fusible link opened. Now, in today's day and age, it's very easy to just bypass that link. We could wire that directly back and then convert to a, um, a bimetal limit instead. So that would be my, rec my recommendation is you do have the ability and the option to convert to bimetal if you wanted to. These bimetal limits have the ability to be both in line and pilot duty. Uh, now what I mean by that is if it's got the load, so say that this is your load wire coming through the contact, right? Uh, that makes these safeties a load duty safety. They're physically carrying the amps of, of the heat strips. A pilot duty would be one, say we had a little stub out over here and we had our contactor coil going off. Well, that contactor coil would go through our little safety here. So that if this one tripped, it kills the contactor instead of just opening the, the line. So that would be a pilot duty safety and many, many times we have both in today's day and age. You'll have, you may have one uh, pilot duty per like stage of heat, right? So if we have three stages, you may have one pilot duty between the uh, uh, two strips and you may have another pilot duty by limit dedicated to the other strip. But usually each of the strips, if you have three, will have a minimum of one load duty safety. To where it'll have, they just act as redundancy to each other. Um, yeah. Obviously, so a really common place to get heat strips if they fail. Uh, so many of your supply houses will have a just like the standard heat kits. Uh, sometimes they'll have actual heat street like restream kits. Uh, you, usually the controls or automation supply houses will actually carry an assortment of different voltages and KWs for re restreams. Uh, now there's a, there's a bit of a disagreement in the industry. Most people say it's not worth the time and trouble to do a restream, just buy a new heat kit every time and if one ever fails just go and plug in a new heat kit and be done with it. Uh, and that has some validity, okay? There are some scenarios, it is truly more cost effective and easier to just go get a new heat kit, install that, instead of trying to do that one single string. But there are other scenarios, especially when you get skilled at doing heat kit or restrings, it's not that hard, but it does take some practice. You can do a restring way faster, and or let me rephrase that, not faster, you can do it a little cheaper then it would cost to go buy a heat kit and install it. So inevitably, it really comes down to that specific situation and your personal choice. Uh, we, you could go either way with it. Uh, I'd say most heat kits are probably you know a couple hundred bucks top end, uh, and it take you 30 minutes to change it out if that. Whereas a restring, you know, if you had to do two strings. Uh, you might spend, you know, $20 on a restring, but it's probably going to take you, you know, maybe an hour uh, to, to get that restring done. So just kind of weigh your options accordingly there. Like I said, uh, so here locally, Amcon is probably the best source that I'm aware of for any of our kit or restrings. Um, they carry 277, 460 base volts. Now, and I'm going to be cautious talking about this because in my mind, 
the voltage really becomes largely irrelevant. It's about the KW at the end of the day. It's going to have a very specific resistance, and so whether you're putting two, 208 volts to it, 277, or if you're putting 460, as long as the KW is set accordingly, it should all work out at the end of the day, is what my mind says. Now, you actually go in and you purchase, okay, I want a 480 5KW heater, and they have a specific package that says 480 5KW heater. Uh, I don't know if that's just for simplicity's sake or what, but uh, I've never challenged it and I've never done the research to verify it. So, how, um, how do we determine how many BTUs we're producing on the heater? Anybody know? It's refresher class. It's, re it's refresher class. We're going back into this time to start thinking about this stuff. So it's volts times amps, and that's equal to watts. Watts times 3.414 is your big watts times 3. That's your big Volts times amps times time, is that your shit? No, 3.414, not 1.4. 3.413 is a pattern. Okay, yeah. Equals watts. Watts times so it's pi, so 3.14. No, 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 it's 414. No, it's 414. Four it's not pi. It's not pi. There you go, 414 equals BTU. Is that right? Hmm? I'm taking a picture of it. Yeah, I think so. I think that's the constant. Uh. 3.4, I think that's right, it's either 414 or 413. Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's another. I usually just do 3.41 myself. Yeah. I don't add the third. Yeah, it really wouldn't matter. Really. It yeah, it's just so marginal. So anyway, uh, regardless, uh, yes, this is how you get to your BTUs. So if you ever needed it, if it ever helps, uh, if you needed to know what KW, your heater was, uh, you can also kind of reverse engineer that as well. So if you know, like on the, on the, on the sticker, that the, uh, uh, say you've got a two stage heater, so you got two heats and they're, uh, it's a 10 kW heater at 460 volts, right? Well, it's pretty easy math at that point. You know that each of those heat strips are gonna be 5kW each. Because what's on that tag is gonna be an accumulation of what's installed. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, if you didn't have a tag available, and let's say one of these heaters uh, failed or burned up, you would be able to uh, It'd be a little tricky. You could take a resistance reading and then know your volts and then through Ohm's law, work your way in reverse to get to the watts or the, or the KW, which is kilowatts. Um, so let's see, that is, oh, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's the, you would take your resistance and divide it into the volts, and that would give you uh, your amps, no watts, that would give you your watts. Yeah, it should be, well they got it. Let's say start I got myself twisted up. So you have watts over amps and volts. And then you have uh, uh, shoot. Yeah, so be amps, volts, right. resistance. Yeah. 
volts resistance and uh, amps. Well, that's a, yeah, same thing. I think that's right. Anyway, how many times have I actually ever used that in the field? Literally just a handful. Yeah, literally just a handful of times. It's been pretty limited. I've ever actually needed that specific piece. But there are very specific scenarios, yes. Um, we can keep rolling here. Safeties. Do the safeties make sense so far? We doing okay there? Now you can use all this to also calculate CFM. Uh, that's not our primary function in this particular class. That's kind of more of an airflow thing. But uh, if you take your BTUs and uh, multiply, no, take your BTUs and divide them by your temperature difference across the heater. Uh, temperature difference multiplied by 1.08 is a coefficient, and then divide that, um, I guess it would be sum, into the BTUs that gives you CFM. I remember using that when I planted fitness, but I do not remember the equation. Yeah, that was, that was the equation. Can you write it down? Yeah. Please. So, to get CFM, CFM equals BTU divided by uh, TD, temperature difference across the heater, multiplied by 1.08 as a coefficient. So, if you're ever questioning, uh, this also applies to gas heat, electric heat, doesn't matter what your heat is, as long as you can determine what your BTU value is, uh, you can find out how many CFM you're moving at any given time. Now, a word of caution, and we'll talk about it more as part of our conversations, but uh, you're, if you're trying to troubleshoot a cooling system and you put it into the heat mode to, get a C, to verify your CFM readings, you want to be careful because many systems will run the fan at two different speeds between heat and cool. So don't let that bite you. Uh, trying to check in the, in the cooling season what your CFM are through the heat, heater and it kick on into a lower fan speed because of it. Follow me? So that just switch our feed tests on the unit? Yeah, usually there's a separate uh, relay. One relay will engage to fire a, a signal, say low speed fan for heat and then G would just activate a high speed fan for, for cooling. Yeah, you, you end up having to, having to basically program the equipment that way. Yeah, it's, uh, it becomes a pain. Mm -hmm. uh, staging, so typically on a commercial level, You've got two basic types of, of heat staging for a um, for like a regular regular strip heat, and it can either be based off of uh, discharge air temp. So say we want to maintain a certain discharge air of say I don't know 120 degrees, okay, as an example. Uh, so at that point, we're going to stage up and down on the discharge air, or we're going to stage up and down on the heat strips based off of discharge air. The vast majority of the time, though, we probably won't see this as much as we will see um, based off of the space temp. So. If we look at our uh, uh, dead band from set point, if we have a set point of 70 degrees at 70, uh, 70.5, we'll bring on stage one. Okay? Say we have a two stage heater. 
Well, if we, hang on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If one stage of heat does not put out enough heat to, to start getting us back to 70, then by the time we hit 69 degrees, we bring on the second stage. Okay? And it'd be as simple as that. And then as this began to increase again and we started getting back to the 69.5, we would stage stage two back down. Uh, you know, until it started dropping, it would kind of a back and forth process there. So as long as it's catching up, it's, it's not going to stage up unless it's falling down. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is pretty typical. A regular thermostat uh, can accomplish this. A lot of automation systems will do this. Uh, you will see it control discharge air if it's dealing with a system that, uh, uh, that runs specifically on discharge air. Right, so if we had an air handler with a bunch of VAVs and we went into a heat mode at that air handler, if it had the capacity, whether it be a hot water coil, electric heat strip, uh, that air handler will then stage the heat to keep the discharge air at a certain temperature so that the boxes are getting fed the temperature we want. Now, whether it so be, if it's got, if it's a big air handler with uh, heating capacity, mm -hmm. would they typically just be Hmm. It's still common to have both. So that's kind of redundant there to have like heat strips on your fan power boxes. That's what zoning Yes and no. So it really depends on the building. Okay. Um, they will usually I've seen it to where they'll still have a perimeter heat from like a fan power box. A dedicated heat from that box. Um, but, I mean, I can't think of a building that the air handler fed that, that they didn't have that perimeter heat still. Okay, I was just curious. It kind of kind of seems like, done in my head. Hmm. I feel like the only units you really see with like a huge heat strip are like older air handlers. Yeah, most of the time. I would say yeah, most, most of your new stuff's not going to have it. You're talking older, more antiquated type equipment at that point. Yeah, I'm surprised not to see the Anyway, this is going to be your basic uh, temperature control, a regular split system or an RTU. You know, this is, this is pretty much what you're looking at. Uh, if, again, if you're looking at a fan power box or something along those lines, um, you're going to have a similar staging process to this. You know, just, they're going to have it that as you get so far away from set point, it's going to stage up and down. Rarely do they really pay that much attention to discharge air temperature. Okay. Uh, SCRs. So a silicone controlled rectifier. <laughs> this is going to be the new age of everything. So this is something to get familiar with now. Uh, just like VRVs or having VFD variable speed type equipment becoming the new standard on everything, SCRs are going to be that. It's, you're going to see less and less of a on off contactor based heater and more and more of SCR technology. What SCRs do though is they basically act like a, um, they act similar to an inverter in the fact of they have a pulsing gate. Okay? So, let's draw it. <laughs> what? Like You'll have a T1 and L1 going back to power supply. And then coming off of that, you will have um, a set of terminals. Most of the time, it'll be like a, a two terminal setup. Uh, and you'll have your 
comment and uh, input. So we got a couple of ways that these control, but we can either feed it uh, like a zero to 10 volts of VDC, or we could do a four to 20 milliamp signal. Okay, those are the two most common ways that, that they are controlled and used. With that, there's a little gate in here that fires. And this is, again, this is very similar to how a inverter gate operates. Is the more, the higher the signal, the more demand that there is, the faster the gate fires, keeping the circuit closed longer so that the heater gets more electricity to it, providing more heat, okay? So say this is a 5kW heater, but uh, we're down one-tenth of a degree off a of set point. All right, well, we don't need, say, 5kW total to take care of that space. You know, it would satisfy that space in a matter of a minute or two and then cycle back off. Well, that's not a good thing. It's wasting a lot of energy. So what we can do is we can send a minimum signal to the SCR and it may be able to take that 5K and turn it into a 2KW. And now we're actually inputting into the Airstream 2KW worth of heat instead of 5K. But even at 2KW, say we're still not able to keep up when we drop another tenth, tenth of a degree. So we're at two tenths below set point now. Well, okay, well we need more demand. So we step up and we go to 2.5KW and so forth until we get below, low enough below set point that we eventually get to the full capacity of that heater to try to keep up with the load. And it's really, that's, that's how we're using SCR heaters. They're, they're just, a, they're a solid state relay that has a gate in them that is controlling that flow. By the time we get to max signal, that gate just slams closed. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, that's exactly what, it's, how do you test, like, right, the meter's freaking out, it's working, like, <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's one way to know that it's doing something. So, yes, if you, if you put your clamp on it, you're going to see your, your clamp is freaking out because it's not used to seeing that pulsation. All right? End of the day, what you can do is take a reading and see, you know, am I getting a control signal here? Now, 0 to 10 volts DC is really easy to take that reading on. You just read it. Uh, 4 to 20 milliamps, you have to put your meter in line with that signal to, to see how much it's getting fed. Would it matter with, is there a clarity there? Is there, is there a situation? You'll, you'll want to put it on the input side. And so the, the, or the positive side, instead of the negative. Uh, yeah. That's a real common, uh, honestly, a lot of, most automation systems probably lean more towards the zero to 10 volts nowadays. A lot of it, especially older systems, I see a lot more of the four to 20 milliamp. Uh, but four to 20 milliamp is still commonly used even in new equipment and installs. So it's definitely something to get familiar with. Anyway, so you would put your meter in line and then you would see, you know, are you, so if, if you're calling for say 10, 10 volts of VDC and the heater's barely putting out any heat, something's going on. Most of the time these either work or fail. In my experience, it's pretty rare to see one kind of intermittently not really putting out voltage even though it's, it is but it isn't. I don't think I've ever ran into that scenario. I'm not saying it's not possible. I've never seen that. Uh, it's when I walk up to them, it's either they're, they're functioning or they're not. Uh, and that's, that's the easiest test I have uh, that I can recommend is, are you, uh, 
Are you getting control signal? Yes or no? Yeah, and a recommendation I would have is this it's invest in a signal generator. Right? You can buy an inexpensive one online that will function just fine, run off of a battery. And uh, you can hook up to one of these. So say you're in the field and you're trying to troubleshoot it, but you can't get the signal from the automation controller that you want to bring it on. Okay, well, disconnect the automation control, hook up your signal generator and ramp it up to see if it comes on. That whole battery does the same thing on the Jerry Tim PC. Just... Yeah. <laughs> it goes nice. Just hit it with a nut and hold it. DC? I mean, that's what you I never tried that, but... I, I, it makes sense. Anyway, it's either, again, it's, it's either going to work or it's not. So if you give it, you know, you, you put that signal generator on it and you tell it to turn on, you know, you give it a, a signal and it doesn't, obviously something's wrong. Um, now you do have the ability to actually test the gates. Okay, you can do, it, it, you, you would use a diode test to test the gates. Um, but that's going to, your results of what those readings should be are going to vary uh, relay to relay. Okay, they're not going to be exactly the same. So uh, uh, relay specific parameters and then mm -hmm. compare that to the dumb kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. Now they do make so this is my specific drawing here is of a, of a single phase SCR. A three-phase SCR would have two legs, and the third leg would still be straight to straight to uh, source. Okay, so just keep that in mind. If you walk up and you see an SCR it has a T1, T2, L1, L2 on it, and it's on a three-phase unit, that's going to be a three-phase SCR. That makes sense. Now, an immediate indicator, without ever opening a control panel, that you have an SCR is you'll have a heat sink. So whenever you are walking around or you pop a ceiling towel, whatever it is, if you look on the outside of the control cabinet, uh, you'll see this big, usually aluminum, if they're not painted over. A lot of times they end up getting painted over, but you'll see this big block of metal with a bunch of fins and stuff sticking out of the side of the control panel. That is the heat sink that helps protect that SCR from overheating. So as soon as you see that, you should automatically know what you're dealing with. Yeah. 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 It's true. Is there a little box hanging on the side of it? <laughs> <laughs> so another thing I don't want you to confuse you is many times, and this will be after the SCR typically, they will have a, uh, a contactor. Okay? This is a safety interlock. So just keep that in mind. And usually all three legs will run through it, or, all, or both legs, just de depending on the scenario. So it won't allow the, um, if, there, if a, one of the pilot duty safeties trip, this is what that pilot trips. It'll open that contactor, and this will be outputting, but obviously it won't be going through. So as soon as you get a call for heat, contactor is gonna slam, but your SCR is still gonna regulate Yes. Yes. And that's one way to know if you have a heat call or if all your heat safeties are closed, this contactor will close. If not, you have a control voltage. Mm -hmm. And so if your fan proving switch is open, you got a high limit open, anything of that nature, this contactor will not draw in. So just keep that in mind. And don't let this confuse you and think, oh, well, how do I have both? You know, how can it be both? No, it's not both. This is a safety device. That's all it's being used for at that point. Um, <laughs> they're very expensive, by the way. They're not cheap to buy, especially the three-phase versions. Uh, typically, not always, but many times, like for Titus, for example, any of the Titus uh, fan power boxes that I've had to work on that have a three-phase heater in them, the distributor doesn't carry those heaters. They have to be specially built every time. So every time I've had one fail, most customers 
will usually buy two or three at a time, which are usually several hundred dollars per, and they'll have to put the order in, they'll manufacture them, and then send them in, and it takes several weeks to a month or two. So just keep that in mind, and if you're ever working with a customer and y'all have that conversation, you can let them know that there's going to be some lead time. It's, those are, they do not have a quick turnaround. Yeah, basically, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so uh, now single phase uh, SCRs, I've not had as much trouble with. So, and it's not as simple as just going and installing a second SCR to hit the other phase. All right, it, it's it's don't don't think you're going to outsmart how the system's going to function because it's it's not that easy. So you'd have to you'd have to set it up and install it appropriately, and then yeah, the gates would would need to be in sync. Okay. Uh, leave Curtis to blow something up. Anyway, does this help make SCRs make a little more sense? Yes. Okay. What's our time? Six fifteen. Have any questions so far? Curious. They're not in there. They're just acting like they're there. Okay. All right. We will keep rolling here. They can hear you on the set of mine. Lovely. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I remember the first time I seen this. I'm confused. I was. And that seems like. You know, I remember that phone call. I was up on the ladder like. All right, so single phase heat, we're pretty familiar with, right? You know, you've got two lines in, two lines out, everything connects, it either works or it doesn't, right? Okay, three phase is where people get in trouble. So there's two styles of three phase wiring schematics. Uh, the first one I can draw from memory without too much trouble. So you will have a common bar, and off of that bar, you will have your independent, well, you need to add a little yeah, I mean, squiggly lights. You will have your heaters, okay? You like that? And so this would be, say, uh, you'd have L1 feeding this heater, L2, L3. And they all feed together, and their common points are in the middle here. All right? So this would be a, 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 a common bar style. This is pretty, I see these the most on fan powered boxes, honestly. A lot of your RTUs and larger equipment will use the other style, which we'll get to. I'll even see if I can draw from memory. But this is very common on especially smaller equipment. You'll just see a brass bar uh, shoved off in there, and you, <clears throat> you need at least two phases fired to make it work. So the first stage will be L1, L2. Third stage, or second stage, sorry, will be L3 by itself. Follow that? No, the second phase would be all three of them. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, I'm them sorry. Okay. I, 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 as in, it, it will only bring on L3 on the oh, second okay. stage, but all three legs will be running. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that confusingly. This is one version. I don't see to this gives people too much trouble, right? This makes pretty good sense. Now the, 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 the leg. So, and they, and they split evenly. They do. So, all three of these legs are going to have an even draw. Because they're all converging in this bar, and this is the main connection point. Casey's asking, how is it not short? Uh, don't just keep you have a the so. where it goes, so there's no possible way for it to short. Okay. Yeah, yeah, as long as you've got the load. That's the critical part. All right, let's see if I can do this. I don't think you can do it. Just by the face you gave me. <laughs> so you have 
Let's, we'll do keep it simple. We'll draw just three meters. Basically. All right. So this is going to be your L1, L2, and L3. So the tail end of uh, L1 will feed down and hit the front end of L2. And essentially, the tail end of L3 or L2 will feed down and hit the front end of L3. And then you'll come back up and L3, I don't have any additional colors, will basically just come out and catch the front end of L1. And then each of these are still feeding their legs there. That's about as simple as I think I can make that. Right, and, and so and this, but this is what they're doing. So in the same sense that it functions here, it has to function here. L2 and L1 have to fire first stage. Second stage, L3 comes in, joins the circuit. But this is how they distribute the power to load. It's almost the exact same thing, though. Not really, but kind of. So it doesn't make sense. So you and you'll literally have wire jumper wires. Right. Like, and this that is where people get just scrambled in the head. <laughs> what well, is they see all these jumper wires jumping between each of the different phases, and I I made it simple. You may have. L1 here coming to the front end of L3 and they may do it completely different. They're accomplishing the same function. The same fact of the matter is still happening. But this is this is what's happening on a simplified version. So everything's running in series and parallel at the same time. Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all it would still be parallel. You don't have it in series in this case. Like just, I see it coming out of one and feeding the beginning of two, and coming out of two and feeding the beginning of three, and coming back to one, and it looks like it's all just coming Yeah, and it's, it's all a bunch of jumpers. Like yeah. Yeah. One of the confusing parts is, is I can say that it doesn't short, but why does it need the feedback if it doesn't short? So, why does what need the, 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 the part that connects on it, the part that connects each phase together. See, in this case, the blue and red. So, you have somewhere blue that you see to go. Yeah, you have to have electron flow. And then you've got something that will short. I mean, I guess I don't understand that. Just trying to keep it moving in the same direction. But why does that? You're okay. Think it, about your electrons. Right, so that's what I'm thinking yeah. about. I'm thinking yeah. I'll be on, on this. But the electrons, they essentially met, and that's why it's not shorting, is because they come together. They're, they're essentially the same state at this point, Yep. regardless of the phase. So they're not, there's no potential difference. And then the jumper comes back. Then, then, then why, again, there, does, does it doesn't have to be a path? back through this to, to another another place. Like, if it's you just... So, how about this? At this point, eliminate these two and this third jumper. Mm -hmm. You've got one, one completed circuit for that heater. Okay? One completed circuit for that heater. And then one completed circuit for that heater. Now, <laughs> yeah, you're, you've got a you've got a completed circuit, right? So we're flowing in through L1, coming through and hitting L2. There's one circuit through that heater, okay? And then we come here, and we've got a completed circuit. Same thing. And then that one's up backwards, upside down. And then the same thing again. Here, back up, up to L1. Completed circuit. Right? So it's three independent completed circuits, but instead of them having just a simplified bar in the unit, they are, these, these lines are literal wires, and you have a double termination point. So you got two heaters hooked up to this one point, but they're only flowing power to one individual, like each line's flowing to two different heaters. But they're making a termination spot right there. So 
that is where the wire scramble happens. And most factory schematics, genuinely, honestly, they, they make it, it looks more confusing, but they don't have the ability to really make it simpler either. Because they have to make it all, like they've got all the safeties they have to put in, that, in those schematics. I mean, there's so many things they have to fit in. They try to simplify it as best they can, but they can only go so far with it. In your first, in your first example, what is the path back? Because it comes through here and back up. Right, I guess. Or through L1. Yeah, either way you look at it, yeah. 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 So, this as simple as it can be drawn. Now you think about, okay, add all the safeties and add all the contacts and the elements and the parameters. And we're talking strictly a two stage, all right? Now throw in an additional two to three heaters for additional stages. And then it just becomes complex. And then it becomes even more complex. I'm not even sure I could draw that myself, to be honest. Like, because that'll, that'll be what'll happen is L1 will feed two sets of heaters. And L2 may feed two sets of heaters. And L3 may feed two sets of heaters. And each of those sets of heaters has their own jumper network to tie them back to L1 to 2 and 2 to 3 and then 3 to 1 and 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 and 1. That's where it gets tripped up. Believe me, I remember the first time I saw this myself. I vividly remember it was a RUD RTU and it took me an entire day to figure out I had a bad heater. This was... About eight years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, believe me, I know, I, I understand, but this is as simple as you can make it. Finding that all impractical that can be challenging. That's mm -hmm. just a matter of pull the coil out, make sure it's in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> you have to <laughs> <pull> it out. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah, it's it's very challenging. Which one is which? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 100%. And then, Part of it all is you've got a whole, okay. You've got a control panel here. And so you've got your contactors and stuff up here. And then you'll have a terminal, and terminal, and terminal, and terminal, 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 terminal. And then this will be one heater, one heater, one heater, and one heater. And each of these are jumping to the other heater, and this is jumping back around to this heater, and you mm -hmm. pay picture it, and that's just one set. You got a whole another set over here doing the exact same thing. That's what it looks like when you open that electrical panel and you're staring at it. It ain't nothing but a ball of wires. And then you're having to ohm and voltage check and troubleshoot that. Not to mention, that's, that doesn't include all the safeties you're going to have in there, because you're going to have a safety here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. Those are the low duty safeties. Then you got the pilot duty safeties, which would be here, 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 and here. I can already think of an entire book that's all I can really confuse my mind. Yeah, anxiety right here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so believe me, take your time when you run into these, because you need it. It's not as simple, easy, and straightforward as that. But it is, but it's not. The fundamental principles stay the same. Okay? <laughs> so I'm kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> something I'll throw in there. Big question comes up: How do we have you know three phases? Okay, and I'll touch on this real quick because I only recently got a deeper understanding of this myself. All right, so we've got a sine wave. In that sine wave, you know, here's one phase. Oh. I got a question. Yes. Yeah, those say L1, 2, and 3. 
One of those has to be a neutral, though, correct? Uh, no, no. Now there are scenarios to what you're saying. There are scenarios where one of these will have more heaters stacked on it on the back side. So it's not being used as a neutral. It has additional load stacked on it. So part of what he's saying is you'll walk up to some of these and like L3, for example, these may be pulling 20 amps, 20 amps, this one will be pulling 30. And it's because of having multiple heats and stages the way it gets wired in, it adds additional load to the way they wired it to that one particular leg over the other two. So instead of that, are using it as a junction for more heaters, basically. Basically. But a single phase heater. Yeah. It, oh yeah. It's the whole. Everything. All single phase. It's all single phase. Okay. Like, there's no three phase. Single phase. I guess. Yeah. 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 All tied together. Three single phase. Did that help? I think he's asking. Yes. Say again, I'm sorry. No, yeah, it helped. Okay. All right, making sure. All right, so we have one phase. Two phase. Yeah, he practices what he holds on the way. And your third phase, okay? So this is what an oscilloscope, maybe a little more staggered than that, would look like if you actually were to graph the sine waves. Pretend like all those peaks are the same level. Yeah. yeah. No. We're, we're not being critical. They, they, they are. We're not being critical. Anyway, what they're doing at the power plant or at the, at the generators is the generators are literally spinning uh, slightly out of rotation, rotational phase from each other. Okay, so you've got three generators. Essentially, this one will start up just a fraction of a second before the second one starts. And the second one starts a fraction of a second before the third one starts. It's like a motor. Hmm? It's like a, like a combustion engine. One, two, three, back to one. Right, back to right, 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 exactly. So with that, because all three of them are slightly staggered in their starting, their, their sign, their phasing ends up being staggered as well. And that's on an extremely basic level, this is as far as I even understand it myself, that's how they're generating a three phase differential, or that's how we get two phases, is those those generators are slightly staggered in their their rotational clock, if you will, and how they, they run them. And that's how, you know, we, we, that, that's where we get it. Just kind of a fun fact there I was throwing in there because I was pretty no, 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 intrigued when I found that no, 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 and I was like, huh, that makes a heck of a lot of sense. That just brings up a whole bunch more. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then it's like, so how do they control the phase of the generators? Well, it's all about RPM. So it's all about 33 degrees? Or, or, uh, you know, yeah, yeah no, they, it's, it's all about RPM. They're, they're controlling, you know, they're going to, they set those generators to run at a set RPM that maintains a set current draw at a set speed, and it's all continuous. Yeah, but they have to be at different spots in the same rotation. Yes. Yes. Basically. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So how are they, that's another question, like how are we yeah. controlling the, 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 what spot each phase is hitting in rotation? One guy goes around and he's looking over. One, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. And, and I'll tell you what, if you want a better explanation than I can give, Engineering Mindset has a video on three phase power and generation that uh, is pretty good. I might, might help some of that. I like that one. It doesn't go up too crazy. What I was going to say, uh, the way I think about uh, right there, the, uh, the center example, was is 
is that uh, I'm not really sure I'm explaining on how the electrons are going. To me, it's just they're just kind of going in and out of each other because I mean they're all connected. But when you have the proper amount of voltage for which the uh, heater is rated for, then it's going to react and do what it was designed to do, which is obviously uh, make heat, release heat. Um, that's that's what I, the way I think about it too. Uh, to kind of give it a clear picture, um, like say you have um, 120, 120, it's rated 240, then it's going to start to glow, it's going to come on. Um, and I just try to keep it simple. Yeah, I throw, it threw me off too when I when I see it. Well, not anymore because I'm used to it. But you know, I was like, well, how, where's it going out of? So I mean, I really don't try to overthink it. I just right. think, okay, it's just coming in and out of each other. Like it's, it's working. It's almost as if it's it's in line. Like it's um, not necessarily a load, but like almost like a switch, like something just um, except it's reacting because we have that proper amount of voltage. It's going to start glowing. Like fuse, but except that's not what it was designed for. It's designed just to, to power go through. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's gonna it's gonna release heat because that's what it was made for. But anyways, that's as simple as I can get in my my mind, anyways. Yeah. And I don't see that. Is there like extra energy yeah. into the strip is released at heat? Right. Once it gets, yeah. Once it gets. They're so like, uh, why is it not screwing itself up? It is. But right. right. Yeah. I thought we were doing that. kind of dive into heat pumps a little bit to kind of wrap up the tail end. Yeah, you just gotta take a step back. Uh, yeah. yeah, you might be able to get it. So with a heat pump, it's basically a standard cooling system except we've got a reversing valve with, that we reverse refrigerant flow. The evaporator coil becomes the outdoor coil. The condenser coil becomes the indoor coil, and you know we, we switch operations, right? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, coming fresh out of school, how comfortable do you feel that? Do I need to draw that or? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's make it. Oh boy! <laughs> so we got your condenser coil or your outdoor coil. Uh, you coil, you have your compressor, we have our uh, reversing valve, and out, every true suction going to the compressor. And one of these is going to go here. Your liquid line going out. And we come into our evaporator, our indoor coil. Okay, so the suction comes to the top of the indoor coil. The liquid line feeds to a metering device, feeds to the bottom of the indoor coil. Discharge feeds to the top of the indoor coil. Liquid comes out the bottom of the outdoor coil. Um, this would be your reversing valve controlling flow of direction. So one of the things that makes a heat pump unique is you end up having a, uh, a metering device, basically, uh, we've got a couple of ways to draw it, I'm going to draw it in here. Metering device in here feeding the bottom of the coil, all right? A lot of times these will have some form of uh, check valve. This will have a check valve. Uh, typically this will either be internally checked or it'll have some form of external check valve as well. Uh, bypassing the metering device. And that's basically all I got to say about heat pump. <laughs> so our, inevitably our focus here, our goal here, is to take heat from outside, so it, it, it may be 40 degrees outside, 
But there's still a lot of heat energy in that air that we can move to inside. So our focus and goal becomes, let's take that 40 degrees and let's move it indoors. And, and by doing so, we may be able to put, you know, uh, 50,000, or we'll say, we'll say, uh, like five, we may be able to put 60,000, uh, 60K BTU indoor, but only draw, let's say, five amps on the compressor doing so, whereas to get 60,000 BTUs, we may have to do, you know, 40 amps with electric heat to get the same amount of, of heat capacity, right? Very rough numbers. Please don't pay that close of attention to the numbers. <laughs> the point is, you know, this is, this is the whole concept as to why heat pumps are becoming so prevalent and where they began. So in the early stages, this is all a heat pump was, is this reversing valve reversed the coils and reverse flow. The compressor never changed, the, but the valve redirects the flow. So, you know, in this particular case, in regular cooling mode, the discharge line feeds to the top of the outdoor coil. Well, when it switches over to heat mode, we switch over and we feed the suction pipe that would be coming off of the top of the indoor coil, and that now becomes our condensed air and discharge. A major difference I'm going to point out now is with like electric heat or even gas heat for that matter, it's not uncommon to run a lower blower speed in heating. You do not do that with a heat pump. If anything, you may run a lower speed in cooling, but then kick up to high speed for heating. Okay? Just keep that in mind. You, you do not reduce airflow for heating season on a heat pump. That system requires that additional air. Huh? Yes. So, like I said, it's real common practice on other types of heat. Not on a heat pump. Do not do that. You want more fan speed. You want more fan speed. You need, you just, you need that additional air to, to properly process the heat through the system. Because you got to think, look how big a, a typical outdoor coil is. And look how small a typical indoor coil is. Right? Just in the, in the sake of surface area, they may move the same capacity, but we have to achieve a much higher differential uh, between air temp and coil temp to exchange the same amount of heat. Right? So to, to accomplish the same heat exchange, uh, BTUs, we have to have a higher delta. And so that's where you get people get in trouble. You know, they, they run the fan speed too low and it, it struggles running too high of a head pressure in, in, in the winter season. Because they got the fan low. That's no. the same thing with summer, the backwards. Mm -hmm. Basically. Now, what will it cause when they do that? Like when someone says, not now when they slow the fan down. Well, you could have high, high head pressure. High head pressure yeah. and, and strain on the compressor. Yeah. Now, a counteracting factor, keep in mind, is it is colder. The air coming in is, so, so if the house is cold, let's say it's 60 degrees in the house because the unit quit working, all right? Well, you've got colder air, so that's going to mitigate some of that high head pressure issue a little bit. But uh, it's, you still have to control the amount of heat exchange happening. Now one of the critical things and something to understand right now before we go any further with a heat pump system is these are meant and if they're properly designed they will rarely ever turn off. And this is where people if some, so let's say a residential customer for example, right? Commercially people don't even really notice it that much but on a residential level, say somebody is convinced to convert their electric heat system and they're going to install a heat pump this time 
because it's more efficient than the electric heater that they had before, all right? Well, a uh, typical electric heat system may produce 100, 120 degrees supply air coming out of that unit. A heat pump system is designed to maybe do 90, 95 on the top end, typically. So it's a lot lower discharge air temperature. But the point of that system is you're trying to reduce the number of cycles. So instead of you know, putting out a ton of air, you know, electric heater might cycle every 15 to 30 minutes. Well, you, that heat pump, if set up properly, if the airflow is proper, everything is done right, it may literally run eight hours and never cycle. But it keeps the house at proper temperature. Right? That is, so it's, it's a design concept change between uh, gas and electric heat to what we're trying to do on heat pump. Okay? Uh, and that's where almost all your efficiency is always lost with any system is cycles. The more cycles you have, the less efficient you're going to be, period. That's where a majority of your energy is used in that startup. So you might think about that in your own house and stuff is, how can I make this cycle less? And you will be surprised how much lower your electric bill is. Take it. That's okay. A lot of what you're saying right now, we're, we're about to get to. Okay. So, like I said, this is the basic design concept behind what we're trying to accomplish with a heat pump system. And they're, they're this in heating mode, we're not trying to achieve the same thing as the other heaters. And so that's, a, again, when I was doing residential, it's a very common complaint. We, you, you know, you upgrade to a heat pump system. Well, it just never shuts off. You know, this is supposed to be more efficient, yet it can't ever keep up. Pump the brakes a little bit. This, this is how we're getting that extra efficiency. Whether it, and to them, they think, okay, well, the less it runs, the more efficient it's going to be. When in reality, you, you plot the energy used out, you end up quite a bit under with, it, with a heat pump if it's done properly. That's the biggest problem is they're usually not. Anyway. Um, so in that particular case, you know, uh, in cooling mode, this EXV or this metering device gets bypassed and we're flowing through this one. When we cycle over to heat mode, uh, this metering device gets bypassed and we start cycling through this metering device and the outdoor coil. All right, we, so we literally switch. Uh, these could be pistons, they could be uh, TXVs. Some TXVs will internally um, uh, check or they will internally bypass to where it, once it's, once it, on a mechanical level, once it gets flow from the opposite direction, it will force the valve open and allow it to flow the other direction. Don't ask me exactly how that works. I just know that there's supposed to be some valves out there that do that. Now, if it was a piston type system, most of the time those pistons, again, they won't have a check valve. They don't need one. They will, uh, they'll, the way that the cones and stuff are set up in there, when they flow one direction, they'll seat and then they'll meter. And when they get flow the other direction, they'll unseat from their spot and they'll be able to just, the refrigerant can just flow around it and bypass that, that piston. Pretty straightforward. Really, really simple design. Uh, nowadays, we're getting deeper into EXVs, which with EXVs, we typically don't need uh, bypass uh, or check valves or bypass circuits because the EXV, depending on what mode it's in, will just drive itself to full open or full close, whatever it needs. 
in order to allow flow either direction. Okay? Uh, so, there's been a lot of changes over time. My heat pump system is still going to have an electric heat in it of some sort. Uh, a standard system, okay? We're not discussing mini splits and VRV. We're, we're talking a regular heat pump. Regular heat pump, right? Uh, it's going to have auxiliary or emergency heat installed all, basically all the time. I have actually seen them without it, but it's pretty rare. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that being said, that heat is specifically there for two reasons. Uh, actually, three, if you get real technical. Either the heat pump has gone into defrost, the, uh, the heat pump can't keep up with demand, and the thermostat will bring on auxiliary heat on its own to try to, to get back up closer to set point. Or the outside ambient has gone too low and the heat pump has locked itself out. Those are the three basic conditions at which those indoor heat strips will engage. Now you do have, a, have the ability usually at the thermostat to manually put it in emergency heat, which at that point it cuts out the heat pump side of it and only runs electric heat. You see people do that sometimes when they really have a lack of understanding how their heat pump is supposed to work to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, it is this coil out on the outdoor coil in heating mode is going to freeze up. It is going to happen. It is meant to happen. It's how it's built. Now, much older systems, before they got as sophisticated as they are today, uh, had timed defrost so that every so often set on a timer controlled by the board, which you could adjust, it had a little like jumpers you could have set on there, you could set how much defrost and when you would, you would trigger. And the system would automatically go into defrost and it would go through a defrost cycle. What will happen is you typically have uh, let's get into the wiring real quick. So, on your thermostat for a heat pump, you'll have uh, R, C, Y, W, O, and uh, no, that'll be it. On a basic level, now it gets more com complicated than this, but on a basic level, this is what you would have at the thermostat. All right. G. Hmm? G oh, G. Thank you. I knew I was missing I something. Knew. I, I said, knew I was missing I, I something. I said it, but nobody said anything. And I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> This is what happens when you spend too much time on chillers. You forget stuff. No fan go on. <laughs> <laughs> no fan go on that. We don't need that furnace, all right? <laughs> okay, so typically on, on the indoor, now it depends. Some systems like train, for example, a lot of times the outdoor uh, wiring will go, will be a pass through through the indoor unit controls. So you'll have like a set of inputs on the indoor control board. The, the TAM series by train is notorious for this. Uh, there'll be a set of inputs and then there'll be a set of output terminals. So input terminals are from the thermostat, the output terminals are going to the outdoor unit. And so train, that's one of the various versions of their setup. Um, many times, especially on a basic level, you only need um, just G and W at the uh, at the indoor unit. That would be all that's required. Okay? And I'm not going to draw all this, but at the outdoor unit, this is indoor, outdoor, and keep in mind, I'm trying to keep this simple. There are 
hundreds of variations of this. I'm probably not actually hundreds, but there's a couple of dozen variations this could actually be. I'm trying to keep this as simple as I can. The outdoor unit terminals, you will have an R, a C, an O. Um, you'll have a Y, and it could be either um, L, X, or, no, it wouldn't be B. B is, B is common on train. Typically, it'll be like an L or an X. I, I have actually seen them designated as W before. It'll be one of those three at the outdoor unit. Okay? So what you would have is your Y would uh, come down and hit Y. Your O would terminate to O on reversing. Obviously, your G is going to go here. Now, your W is what gets intriguing. So it will come down. We'll just do one jump here. And it will split. You have one go here and one go here. Now, fill in the blanks on the rest. But uh, if you're going into heat mode, so everybody except Ream and maybe a few kind of oddballs here and there, but of the major manufacturers, everybody but Ream will have, uh, will default to, uh, to heat. Will default to heat. Ream defaults to cool, meaning that no signal on the O or B, so if you're trained, you're, you're using B. And they might. Like I said, short of, Short of some, some others, there, there are others. But it can be O or B, I guess I could draw that here. I thought B was common on train usually. Not to the version of um, Sure. I mean, I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, for the sake of I can't verify that from memory, I'll just leave it go with that. The, the point is, is yeah, no, yeah, like I said, there's several configurations of this. Take the basic principle of what we're talking. So everybody but Ream, for the most part, will not energize O for heat. They will only energize Y. And Y becomes the outdoor coil con uh, uh, signal, not the cooling signal. Like we normally we're trained to think, okay, Y is your cooling signal. Actually, in the heat pump, it strictly means it's firing your outdoor coil. That's its function, is why. So O decides, are we gonna be heating or cooling? What does it energize? So reverse the reverse velocity. Are we talking about what is Y energize? No, no, no. O, o, o energizes reversing valve, thank you. Uh, so that coil is sitting right up here. It'll look like a little solenoid coil. Uh, anyway. Sorry, I had the trail off for a second, coming back. So in heat mode, we're going to energize Y, and as long as parameters are sufficient, we will turn on and everything will go into a heating mode. And we will not be running the indoor heaters. This will be a stage one heat. W will not be energized at all at this stage. Okay? You have nothing on W. Um, now, the newer heat pump systems will actually have coil sensors that are monitoring the coil temperature. So that when it registers that the coil temperature gets below a certain degrees, it knows it's a frozen block of ice and needs to go ahead and do a defrost. When that happens, that's when the outdoor unit will activate the L, X, or W. We'll just reference it as W. Uh, the outdoor unit will activate the W terminal, and it will turn on the auxiliary heat from the outdoor unit. The thermostat will never know this happened. This will go through the outdoor unit. The outdoor unit will bring the heat on directly inside. And when it does, you're going to hear the reversing valve cycle on its own. We never got a signal from O. 
Okay? Thermostat never asks for this. This is all happening internally at the outdoor unit. And so what it does, it literally just flip flops them and the indoor coil begins to cool again. The outdoor coil begins to become the condenser again and it runs in cooling mode to heat up the outdoor coil to defrost it. Now, what will happen at the same time is your condenser, your, yeah, your outdoor fan relay will trigger and your fan will shut off when you're in defrost. So that you build heat, you defrost faster. But it, you know, instead of having you know thirty degree air flowing across your coil, you're trying to get all the ice off of. So that's an immediate indicator that you're in defrost. Now, again, many modern systems will see that once it sees the coil temperature get back above a certain temperature it will automatically come out of defrost, cycle back over to heating mode, and it will kill the, um, the W signal and turn the auxiliary heats back off. So the whole time you're in defrost, uh, your auxiliary heat primary function is to mitigate the cooling effect that's happening from, uh, right at the what's now become the evaporator again. Okay? So if your fan is not running on frozen coal, you're in deep frost. Yes. If your fan is not running and you're trying to heat outside, something's wrong. If it's not in deep frost and it's not running, it's in heat, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be the only scenario where the fan doesn't run with the compressor is unless you're like trying to do low ambient control yeah. on a commercial building while it's still cooling, right? I mean, we still have that. Now, low ambient control on a heat pump is a little different than on a straight cooling system. So keep that in mind. Probably not going to go into that right now. Just, they're, they're, they don't work exactly the same. I've seen it flash emergency uh, heat on the thermostat uh, one time. And so that's exactly scenario number three. We'll go ahead and touch on that. So say the heat pump's running. It's 35 degrees outside. It's doing as best it can. But our set point of 70 degrees, we're down to 69, and it's still dropping, and it cannot keep up. The thermostat will sense that, and it will bring on what will be considered second stage heat or emergency slash auxiliary heat. And the thermostat, while still calling for Y, will also call for W. And it will run both the heat strips and the heat pump together to compensate for the, for the lack of the heat pump's ability to keep up. And that would be an, an, an additional scenario where you would, you would ha bring on those electric heaters. So, huh? No, I was just saying that that's probably, like you're saying, it's not very common because the heat pumps are, we don't get that cold here too much. No, it, it, it happens. No, it definitely happens. Uh, especially, you know, if the heat pump starts to struggle with charge issues or if there is any kind of airflow issues or say we're not defrosting properly, anything of that nature, it's not too uncommon. It's a matter of can you, do you catch it happening more than anything. But it's not too uncommon to have to have, on our cold days, both of them run together. Since I started doing ACs, I get a call every year from family member with a heat pump. It's not working. Is it frozen solid outside? Yeah. No. It's, it's a constant thing. Like, I, I don't know if so it's, a, it's just the older models or if it's the thermostats, but like, I guess your cheaper therm thermostats or cheaper heat pumps, I've seen it where they won't switch over automatically. They just turn it to a block of ice and Sometimes it gets cold in the house. Hmm? The resting valve or yeah. the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. But I would get a call every year and it's like, just go to your thermostat, put it in emergency, call me in an hour. Well, and, and honestly, the most common failure point I've ever seen with a heat pump system is the defrost control board. 
I've rarely seen, even on the cooling side, I've not seen a board fail, like a, spe a specific component across the board fail more than defrost controls. I don't know why, they just, they, you change them all winter long. They just, they, they constantly fail for whatever reasons, doesn't matter what manufacturer you're working with, whether it be the fan relay fails, they don't sense the sensors properly, you know, just go down the list. They constantly have issues. Very common weak point. Strange. And again, so in that scenario, uh, say we get down, say the, the, once you get below 20 degrees outside, the outdoor unit says, okay, it's too cold of an ambient. I'm, I'm, I'm no longer efficient to run. It's a waste of time for me to turn on. It will shut itself off and lock out on low ambient. Um, and then it will automatically bring on W. Again, thermostat will never see it. It does not know that that's happening. Uh, granted, we have communicating thermostats today. I'm not referencing those systems whatsoever. I'm saying on a standard system, that thermostat has no control at that point, knowing that the outdoor unit did that. The newer, the newer, like I've seen the newer inverter pumps, but they want to turn on below 65 degrees outside. The condensing unit won't come on. Well, no, no, but below 65 degrees outside, that they will not turn on my heat pump. Like, like it, it, it just was it a bonnet inverter system? And the damn discharge line or liquid line actually went through the board on the... Yeah, you know what they do that for, right? So it's ready for temperature, I guess? Mm. So, a lot of your inverter-driven systems, they'll run... Now, you can't have a board condensate, so you can't use the suction. But they'll run the... Uh, a lot of times, like the liquid line, mm -hmm. through the... Uh, control cabinet and, and have it on the heat exchanger so that it, it draws all the heat out of the control boards. Huh? Well, you think of an inverter, really, right? Yeah, yeah. And you... But basically, ladies, the ladies outdoor unit wouldn't function at, at over, under 65 degrees in heat outside, it, it considered it. Well, Sounds like something's wrong with it because. Most of them shoot, are usually designed to run down into the 30s, if not the 20s, on the low end. So the fact that it wouldn't turn on below 65, I would question that something broke. It ain't reading something right. I'm not saying I'm not wrong, but that would be extremely unusual as far as I'm concerned. Right. Yeah. No. 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 Right. It would be a waste of. Especially, I mean, you're, you're spending an, an inverter system today on a house. I mean, you're talking a $20,000 system. And it's going to kick itself out on low ambient at 65 degrees. That's, that's, a, that's a waste of money. <laughs> so, now, we'll hit on that real quick. Uh, mini splits and VRVs are really changing the game when it comes to... Uh, heat pump systems and that's why most of the time or actually they, they don't come with any kind of auxiliary heat because of their ability to control refrigerant flow through exvs and uh, by ramping not only the compressor fan speed but also both indoor and outdoor fan speeds they have an extremely unique ability that they'll run down way further than any standard split I think their, their bottom end of operation, instead of it being like in the 20s, or like down closer to zero before they become too inefficient to operate and lock out. Apex School had a podcast on it, on really low ambient heat yeah. pumps. It was about a year and a half ago, so I don't remember a whole lot of it, but I do remember that number being zero if not negatives for certain areas. Mm -hmm. I have to go look that up. That'd be a good one. I'll try my day. Okay. Yeah, that'd be a good one to share for sure. Yeah, well, and, yeah, and, and 
rightfully so. You know, so many people struggle with it. And there's so many variations out there, it's ridiculous. And the, the anyway, the mini split systems specifically, and again, VRVs are just a more complicated version of the same thing, are really taking the heat pump capacities and abilities to a whole nother level. And so uh, they just, I'm not even sure that I can do it justice by trying to explain exactly how they do it or why, but with their ability to control that system so precisely, like they, I think they do go into defrost, but it's, it's not the same, like it's, it's they're, at, they're on their own, own playing field, honestly. A regular heat, split system heat pump cannot compete with a mini split or a VRV based or a multi split based system uh, on, a, on a heat pump level. And then they take it even further and now they have heat recovery where you can heat and cool at the same time. That's a whole other conversation. I've done a class on that for all those who don't remember. It's, go back and watch it. It's on my channel. So anyway, any final questions on heat pumps? Anybody, anybody online have anything? Any commentary, suggestions? No? What if this is all about safety? Go ahead online. Oh, okay. I don't know. I'm just guessing. What are you going to say, Curtis? Basically, everything applies the same for a water force heat pump. It's just a matter of transferring the heat to the Yes. With our deep process, it's not relevant. Yeah, the deep process is not relevant. Yeah, and that is true. Yes, correct. We didn't touch on it. I'm actually glad you brought it up because I had forgotten about it. Water source heat pumps operate at a completely different sequence of operation. They're, like I said, there's no defrost or anything needed. And that's where a boiler system comes in. That's, that's one of the things that a lot of engineers really struggle to understand too, is you have to have a functioning boiler with a water source heat pump system. All right. Yeah, that, that boiler has to keep that water temp up because what you do is the moment you allow that condenser water loop to drop below 70 degrees, you've now entered a regular low ambient state that that unit will never perform it. It'll never operate. And you'll the same exact symptoms you'll have with a regular split system, low ambient, you'll have with a water source heat pump. That boiler is critical. It has to run and it should maintain that loop at around a minimum 75, I prefer a, a, a baseline of 80, 85 condenser water going through that, that coil. So just keep that in mind. What kind of questions do you have about boilers? Oh, I want to have a whole list. What kind of questions? <laughs> that's, that's a whole tangent right there. Okay, with that, if everybody's good, appreciate everybody online. Uh, I am adjusting how I'm doing these videos, so in the future, um, instead of me trying to edit down an entire two-hour class like I've done in the past, I no longer have the capacity or the time for that. So basically, I'm going to be posting the raw classes going forward. That way I can turn the class around and get it posted within a week or two versus it taking me a couple of months to try to get a two-hour edit done.